What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guest is James Hobart, eight-time CrossFit Games veteran, uh, three-time CrossFit Games team champion. This year, James placed 33rd in the CrossFit game or the CrossFit Open worldwide, and he chose to decline his invitation. And so, one of the topics that we talk about is the is how to deal with kind of going from identifying as an athlete to no longer competing. And so the, this is something that I could definitely relate to having gone through a serious back surgery years ago and thinking that I would be done competing forever. And so that was really interesting to discuss with him. Uh, James has also been on the CrossFit Level 1 staff for six or seven years, and he's worked with thousands of aspiring coaches. And so we talk a lot about coaching and leadership. Uh, and in general, James is just a very thoughtful, uh, intelligent, guy and he's a, a very skilled coach so lots to learn in this one hope you enjoy the show what's up everyone this is mike Cashew. this is the brute strength podcast i'm here with james hobart would you would would you even be considered the crossfit kid or would that be more pat barber i feel like i'm yeah maybe i think pat had that nickname first and i feel like i feel like i'm a little old for that now but it has a nice ring to it <laughs> just a, just an og in terms of uh being a competitor, uh, as well as just being a part of the uh, one staff and the and the community in general, um, I'm really, really, really excited to do this show with you. We've been trying to connect for a while, um, so I thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to do this, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mike, thank you uh, for having me here, and uh, I really appreciate it. Since since and since watching uh, how much you guys have grown, and so like I said, it's awesome to be here, and I uh, appreciate it. So I want to start out with a really pressing uh, question. How much would it cost you to make out with Austin Maliolo in the middle of the new Madison Stadium at the games? And so here's the situation. So you and Austin, are, you're both getting paid, but no one else can know. And later you can claim that it was just like a phase you were going through, but you can't tell any of the public that you were paid to, to do this. So what's your what's your number? How much would that cost? Like what kind of kiss? Like a true like tongue makeout? Um, yeah, I would say a five second Frencher. Uh, five second Frencher. That's <laughs> legit. The um, I think the the original Rich Froning might listen to this. So choose your number wisely. Oh geez, maybe if Dave would let me program the CrossFit Games for the following year and the regionals. You think you'd literally do it if he would let you program? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what's the what's the worst that could happen, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'd do I'm sure it I'll for... get some emails on that. I'll see my followers just get cut in half yeah. now on Instagram. But hey, I mean, if you get five million, you know, maybe it's worth. Yeah, it. I don't know. Austin's got some bad breath, though. Really? Yeah, that's not something I would know. Uh, that, you know, he he's one of your boys, and, and it could make things weird. So that would probably factor into it too. You know, he's more yeah. like a stranger to me. I've met him on a couple occasions, but, you know, I think it's easier to kiss a stranger than one of your partners. Yeah, because I got to live with that now. I got to look at him every day, huh? Exactly. Ah, whatever. I got, I, got, I got no shame. So there you go. There you go, awesome, Dave Castro. Man. So anyway, I'm super pumped to do this show. I, I think <laughs> of you as some, you know, one of really the best men in our in, in this community in general for so many reasons you've had an enormous amount of success uh, on the competition floor but more importantly you're a veteran one of the veteran l1 trainers and your constant voice of positivity and and even just kindness in the community and i see you as someone really striving to make a difference and along the way you've become really skilled in a lot of areas so i'm pumped to see what uh, you know, myself and the audience can learn from you. So, oh, Mike, thank you. Absolutely, man. So to start out, uh, you placed 33rd in the Open this year worldwide, and you declined your invitation. Not, not you didn't, you know, choose to go team. You just straight up declined. So what, what went, what was up with that decision? Yeah, um, I think like you and I have discussed a little bit about before. I think my my reason for declining was just one. I went into this year's CrossFit Games season. You know, without the intention really to uh, to chase like another affiliate cup 
or compete at the games level. And there, you know, I feel like if I'm not going to try and make it back to the games at either level, I just don't want to go to regionals and, 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 you know, kick it around. So I think that was one of the big reasons I will say, um, you know, I felt, I feel fit and healthy and, um, I was a little bit surprised by my open performance, but I, cause I don't think I've been doing anything miraculously different or new or extra in my training, but I do think, uh, I had a really good mental space and I kind of have said this before and just a much better mental attitude both in and around working out. And I really, I believe that that helped me this year in the open and, and you know, allowed me to, uh, surprise myself a little bit. What does that mean? A, a better mental attitude? I just think in general, just feeling, uh, better balance in my life, um, more certain about the direction that I'm headed in. And I think that translated into workouts. It's like I could be in the moment better. I could handle the, you know, the stress and the pain and the strategy, uh, a lot better. And, you know, I could let my body do its thing rather than give in to, you know, a small example would be like, you know, when it starts to hurt and the negative self-talk creeps in, you know, instead of freaking out and being like, oh, this hurts, this sucks, could be like, all right, there you are, pain, like, welcome back, you know, let's do this. So I think on a small level, that's kind of what it meant to me. But I just, I walked away from every workout feeling better, more confident, more self-assured, I guess. Very interesting. Yeah. Do you think any of that has to do, like, what were your expectations uh, or and even plans going into the open. Did you already know that if you qualified, you'd make that decision, or uh, or what? And so, kind of what I'm getting at is, if you knew you weren't maybe going to go to regionals, was there less? Did you feel less pressure? I think I felt less pressure, but I, I will say the one goal I had, and this is I love the open for this single reason. It's like it's like a yearly checkup, you know. It's like mm-hmm. um, I really wanted to just try and do better than I had the every year. I try to do better than I had the previous year, years, and so I go I go in with that attitude, you know. It's like I love the retests, and um, that was really I guess if there was any specific goal of how to perform in the open, that was up, you know, that was it. Be better than last year's self, even though the tests are a little bit different. I feel like I could confidently walk away from this year and say, you know, at least in the open, I performed better than I did last year. So what does that de- decision feel like now, not not going to the next level? <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, it's, for me, it's the first time in eight years uh, that I won't be competing at the games. And uh, right now, it's okay. You know, my life is full of really great stuff, new opportunities, amazing people. But <laughs> I think um, I'll be doing some work at regionals and, and potentially the games. So I think when I'm at those events, I don't, it'll be, I think there'll be a little moment of melancholy there. I think it, um, you know, I kind of had I joked, I said to, uh, cause my mom and my girlfriend were kind of pushing me hard to go compete as an individual. And I told them that, uh, if I made, um, if I made top three in the combined regional after the open that I would think about it, I would give it real serious consideration. I finished sixth in the combined regional. So, so yeah. well, there, there it is. There it is. I think it would be. I think it'd be being at the games and, and not competing and seeing it, I just the fun. I love. I love competition and I love all of the positive and negative emotions that it draws out of you. So I think being at the games and seeing everybody have do their thing. Well, there'll be a little moment where I'm kind of like a little bumped. I think 100. percent right. That's okay. Do you feel? Is there anything um, going on in terms of like your identity? Do you feel like? Uh, and it, it, this changes your identity as at all at, at, in terms of, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when I had my back surgery or, or after the 2013 games, I knew that I was going to have the back surgery and I thought that I was going to be done competing forever. And I realized yeah. through that experience, most most of my identity was wrapped up in being an athlete. I thought that that was what I was, right? That was what made me worth people's, um, you know, love and what made me who I was. And when I, when I lost that, it was, it was a, you know, kind of a crisis, a personal crisis for a little bit. Um, do you feel any of that going on at all? I mean, yeah, to be totally candid with you, I did not so much anymore, you know, and, 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 you had had a lot of success competing, you know, at, at the games level. And and I'm sure, you know, it's like as I talk about this, you'll probably be nodding your head saying, yeah, I, I felt that way too because I hear the same thing from you. It's when I kind of made that decision of like even before the Open, 
when I made that decision of like, okay, I don't think I'm going to compete and try to make it back to the games. There was, there were, honestly, I don't think I trained, you know, that much between August and I would say November, mm-hmm. you know, if at all, like I would do, I would do like, I would come into the gym, get all fired up, be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to make myself fit and stay fit. And I would work out for a day and I would walk out of the gym and I wouldn't go back to the gym for the rest of the week. Cause in my head, it was just like, what's the point? If I'm not training to go back to the games, what am I doing? And, you know, there were days my girlfriend would come home and she'd be like, what did you do today? And I would say, well, I just sat here. And she'd be like, where? And I was like, right here in this chair. I just sat all day. She's like, you do anything else? And I was like, I ate some food. I read a little bit. And there was always this, like, I would go into the gym and it was this, con- I, I quit more workouts than I've ever quit. And it was like this, you know, what's the point? If I'm not competing to win, you know, what's the point of competing? Mm-hmm. So there was a huge lesson learning there because it was one of those moments of like, and look, I could look back on it now and you could be like, you're just being a little snot nosed turd. You have enormous and great opportunities around you and you're just having a fuss because, you know, you don't, you, you made a choice to not compete anymore. And like, there was no one who said like, you can't compete. You know, no one took that away from me. It was 100% my choice. But I also think it's like because you invest so much time in something, when you decide not to invest that much time into something, you know, you, you do have this feeling of, um, you know, where is my worth? What do I value? And it took a while to get out of that because I didn't really have a plan for what was next. Right. Yeah, for me, I was very, I was very insecure for a while even working out in front of other people because I knew I wasn't at even yeah. nearly as fit as I was. And so I had this really adverse reaction to the gym in general. And so yeah. it's the same thing. And that, that lasted. Um, I worked out for a few months last year when I was living in Santa Cruz with Brooke and Mars and Tommy and all of them. Uh, but other than that, for the last three years, it's been one or two times a week Um, you know, and mostly because of that, that feeling, right? Like I didn't even want to show myself how fit or unfit I was. And so when I got back into it, uh, really this January, it was, it was because I wanted that camaraderie again and I wanted, I wanted what I wanted in the beginning, right? Which was just to be fitter for life, right? I wanted to look good and feel good. And I wanted to, you know, I'm 26 years old. I wanted to, I wanted to feel like I'm a, a young man and not some crusty old fucker, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just rotting away. I, I really wasn't using and, and growing physically, uh, at all in the past few years. And so I can completely relate to those feelings for sure. Yeah. It's really cool to hear you say that, like just the conflict of being like, okay, I want to be fit. I want to be better than my old self. I don't want to be less than my old self, but also being like, I don't want to be in the gym either. Yeah. It was, um, it was a lot of that, man. It's it's really nice to hear you say that. I talked to Pat Barber about it, and he said, you know, after he took some time off, he like he felt like he had um, like like some like onset, you know, like athletes, you know, depression, mm-hmm. essentially. And you know, we talked a lot about that. And he said, you know, like it's a real thing. You got to like don't be afraid to take some time off and think about what you want. Like don't force yourself back in the gym, you know, because it's like your body and your mind are trying to tell you something. Absolutely, but I mean, you know. To Pat's, uh, Pat has has something that you and I don't have. I mean, he's basically a professional surfer now, and he has the best uh, <laughs> spike ball spike in, on, on this side of the Mississippi. So you know, it's easier for him than, than maybe us because he has that those two I, outlets. He does. He does. He's got a good setup out there and in Cali right now. Yeah. Um, do you do you feel like there are a lot of people that are going through what you and I are talking about and, and also kind of hanging on to this idea or, or this focus on the outcome of making it to the regionals or making it to the games and kind of setting themselves up for disappointment? Um, I don't know if there's a lot of people, but I definitely, I definitely think that thing exists. And, you know, I think it's worth making the point that, you know, if I I think a lot of people still compete, whether at games or regional level, regardless of how much time they put in, which is a lot. You know, they compete for the love of the sport, you know, and there are certainly those out there who compete because they want to make a living out of it or, you know, and I really think that you have to try and find something a little bit bigger than yourself that you are competing for. Because when I've looked at people who are at the tip of the spear in the sport and those that I've trained with, 
when I hear them talk about it, I'm sure they would be destroyed if they didn't win or make the games. But when I hear what their like core inner message is, it's not always about fitness. It might be using fitness to, um, you know, support their faith or just be the best them. I know it's just, it, there's always, you know, this common thread of like the best people are doing it for something a little bit bigger than just, you know, themselves or for the simple goal itself. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you'll hear yeah. Katrin and talk constantly about this uh, pursuit of excellence, right? And everything yeah. that she does. And so, you know, and, and rich with his faith, um, you know, a lot of people with, with faith, it, it, it's a, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Like, you know, the, the competition is just a part of that journey, right? Yeah. And I think it took, it took me a little while. You know, I, I felt there were times and moments that, you know, the reasons I was competing were, were about something bigger. But I think it took me a while to really understand and flesh out and learn what, what those things or that thing was, especially once I took competing away. What was that process like? Was there anything like tactical or formal or was it just, um, you know, a, a slow process, uh, like internal process? Um, I think I would say it's slow. I mean, it really it was like for me, I felt like from, you know, just after the games, August up until November, until I had a really healthy balance again with how I felt toward the gym and working out and competing and the rest of my life. And even just a, a, a view of what was my own personal identity and, you know, what was like, you know, what was my own evaluation of self-esteem and how did I care to be portrayed to the rest of the world? Cause when I quit competing, I was like, that's it. If I'm not Hobart, the CrossFit games athlete, I'm just not James Hobart. And you had, you had kind of said this earlier and it like really struck a chord with me. And so at first it was probably pretty unhealthy. Like I said, it was, you know, I wasn't really doing much and, and idle hands they're, you know, it's probably necessary once in a while to, you know, sharpen the ax, as they say, and get some rest. But it just turned into this process of, you know, a lot of days of just sitting around being like, uh, well, I don't really want to do this because it's not the same as competing and maybe this isn't for me. And there's so much value in just sometimes getting off your butt and, and saying, okay, this might not be perfect. However, it's an opportunity. And I don't know. I do not know where it's going to end up. And it could surprise me. And I am only 30, and there's a lot of life left to live. And regardless of whether I'm not going to compete this year, I'm not going to compete at the CrossFit Games level forever. So it took me a lot of like relying on those close to me who give good advice and finding new things to focus my time on, and really trying and trying to realize how you know I wanted to you know what I wanted to stand for in this community and how else I could support it. So you're a super competitive guy. You're, you're 30 and you just placed 33rd in the worldwide open. So I assume you have a shitload of testosterone <laughs> running through you. And, and so, you know, you're probably still very ambitious. So what are you, what are you doing with that extra time and that extra energy now? Like where are you headed? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, like I, I'm definitely training less than I was last year. Um, but I think with, with training side of it, you know, if the goal is not to make it back to the games, I still want to stay fit, you know, like kind of next year in the back of my head, I want to try and beat this year's performance in the open. And if it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine. You know, that's kind of like, that's my own personal fitness goal. But, um, the biggest thing I want to do, I finally realized was like, okay, I want to stay involved with the, with the community. Where else can I contribute? And, uh, cause I do, I, I love, I love the community. I love everything that surrounds the games, I love everything that's behind the game. And I love, you know, the spread of CrossFit and what happens in affiliates and coaching. So the perfect, biggest thing was, you know what, I'm going to go back to what started my love of CrossFit. And I said, I'm going to coach more. I work and I have worked consistently on level one seminar staffs, on level one seminar staff for years now. But I kind of took a huge step back from coaching inside of affiliate. And that's what started me in CrossFit. Like I never wanted to be a competitor first. That was just at first luck and right place and right time so I started coaching more at Reebok CrossFit one and it was almost immediate like I even if I didn't train that day I would coach a class and it was like someone had just you know hit me with a shot of adrenaline it, Hell it yeah. yeah I loved every part of it watching athletes grow watching them PR being in front of a class and it was one of those moments where I was like why the hell did I stop doing this like you're an idiot <laughs> so that was That's probably the first cool. biggest thing 
So before yeah. you move on, I, 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 I don't want to forget to ask you this because it's something that I think about all the time. I do zero in-person coaching now and, yeah. and actually very little remotely now as well. But And the reason that I don't get back into in-person coaching is because I travel so much. And so I'm, I'm yeah. cu- you know, and I don't, I feel like it would be, a, it would be, I wouldn't be a good employee for a, for an affiliate, right? Because I, 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 my schedule is all over the place. I'm wondering if you've figured out um, how to deal with that, if you're still traveling a lot and if so, how you, how you manage that? Well, at this, and it's funny you said that because I was, I was kind of on the road for about two weeks and you come back in the gym and people are like, oh, where have you been? Haven't seen you in a while. You're like, missed having you here. Like, oh, just want to make sure everything was all right. And you're like, oh God, you know, it's like, you got to check in a little more, you know, you need to be a little more present. But right. I'm fortunate enough where this time of the year for all of my duties, um, working with the level one seminar and level two seminar staff traveling on the weekends, I work local ish. So um, everything's in the U S most of it's on the East coast. So my travel usually takes me out from Friday night until Sunday night or Monday morning. So travel's not too bad there. Um, and the other thing is to just try to really be consistent. You know, we don't, the way they run the schedule here is we don't always coach the same exact classes. So we'll kind of throughout a week, touch a little bit of every class, which is nice. And when I am in the gym, I just try to be around class. Like even if I'm not coaching a class, I'll try and work out with class, um, just be out there hanging around heckling people, giving them a hard time. Right. And I think I think that really helps. And just being conscious of it, you know, it's certainly, I will say, something I learned more and more, not just in my gym life and work life as a coach, but in a relationship too. You know, it's like when you're someone who travels a lot, you are used to having a lot of long distance relationships, you know, whether it's right. loved ones or friends or whoever, but you forget it's like the world is not like that for everybody else. And uh, that's not always an easy lesson to learn, but it's a really important lesson to learn. Like you still have to connect with people even though you're on the road. So, you know, I try to, I try to be present when I'm here at the gym, even if I'm not coaching in the class. I love that, man. How do you personally set and manage your expectations for yourself uh, on and off the competition floor? Yeah, um, this is a really good question because – kind of managing my own schedule and expectations has been a learning process or learning process especially over the last year because in terms of the CrossFit Games the expectation was was high but it was pretty straightforward you know is um qualify a team to the regional win the regional you know once you got to the games we had the goal you know was was to win the affiliate cup but there's, you know, those minor steps throughout the weekend, kind of get to the next workout, get to the next workout, get to the next workout. Working from home, and I wonder if, if you can attest to this, and, and having a travel schedule, at first, when I started picking up more work and working from home, I was really all over the place. And it was like, I felt like I was always just taste, chasing the tail end of tasks. And so the simplest thing I first started to do was not even expectation of what I wanted to accomplish was just allocate specific times or even days to try and get some stuff done. I remember uh, talking to you and scheduling this and and you had mentioned something like, Hey, this is the day that we, you know, whatever the time is in the day, but this is the day that we try and try and hammer out the podcast and the interviews. And so that was kind of the first thing I did was just put myself onto a schedule. I love it. Yeah. I mean, working remotely, we're not, we're not brought up with this kind of schedule, right? With, with, with unlimited freedom. And yeah. so everybody, everybody figures it out uh, in their own way or they don't. But so, yeah, one of, the, one of the absolute biggest things for me has been creating rules around uh, my phone and my email, right? Because yeah. if you don't have rules around those two things, you can literally spend all day every day responding to sending out text messages and emails it's it's absolutely insane so yeah one of the one of the biggest things for me is is taking my my most important tasks and getting those done first thing in the day right so i don't have any meetings before noon no podcast most of the time no podcast before noon uh basically i'm not having anyone else uh kind of take my attention away from me, right? I'm going to be yeah. very deliberate and proactive with what I'm doing and I'm not going to be reactive with with all that other kind of stuff. So I can completely relate to that. And it's been 
um, a constant process of, you know, taking a couple steps forward and getting, you know, consistent and getting disciplined and then taking a couple steps back if I go away for a long vacation or something. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely getting better, but it takes, it takes a lot of deliberate, um, you know, focus on it. And I, yeah, I, it's so, yeah, I think it, like the deliberate piece is, is really important because it was like things that were just kind of happening. Like for example, working level one, level two seminars, it always was just like, get scheduled, keep rolling. If you know, you don't end up having work on week one weekend, no big deal. Whereas now it's like, okay, I want to work X amount of seminars in two months. And we you know I want to take one weekend off every eight weeks and just really trying to set up some specific goals for myself mm-hmm. that were time bound. And I know everybody talks about this, but I mean like time bound recently, like not like, oh, in five years, I want to be a millionaire, you know, like, okay, at the end of the year, I want to have worked this many seminars and have uh, coached this many classes. And I think just doing those sort of things have really helped because it's like, if I can set out those simple goals and meet those goals, even if something funky happens throughout the week, I'm kind of like, I can always step back and be like, okay, this, this funky shitty thing happened. I overslept or whatever, but am I still on my overall task? You know, am I still gonna, am I still on mission here? And that's been really helpful. And it's, and I, it's an ever changing and I'm continuing to learn how to do that better, but it, it's taken me a while to kind of manage it. Like you said, with the unlimited freedom, you're sort of like, all right, I could do anything. And then sometimes you realize like, I haven't gotten anything done or I've still been tuck, stuck on this one single thing all day. Right. You know, but at the same time, a lot of people in a, not, in a regular nine to five, um, they end up, you know, in that same situation where they're just not getting anything done, but they at least have the structure of they have to be in the office from five to nine or nine to five. Whereas some of us, you know, could end up yeah. sleeping all day and, and dicking around for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a it's a challenging but fun process for sure. And I would say the one thing this is why this is totally just personal, not really personal, but just unique to me maybe is is like I never used to really be a big breakfast eater, but you know breakfast has really become like a cornerstone of my day. It's just it's so both for me and my girlfriend. She heads off to work early. It's like you know she'll get home really early from the gym. We'll wake up. We'll make breakfast. We'll have breakfast. You know like, and then the rest of the day happens. But that's become one thing where like that happens and then the rest of the day occurs. And I know some people are like, well, yeah, you're supposed to eat breakfast, but it was just, it was, and I'm sure everybody needs to find that moment throughout their day. But that was that thing for me. Like once that happens, it's okay. It's like I had breakfast. Now I'll do my three hours of work. I'll get in my one hour workout. Then we'll go coach classes for the rest of the day. It's been real. That was like the one thing that finally kind of triggered it and has helped me create structure elsewhere. Right. Just funny. Just uh, kind of an anchor for your whole routine, right? Exactly. Right. For me, it's, it's sitting meditation for 20 minutes. If I can get that go. in, uh, at the same time, like I, I crush the rest of the day, cool. even, even if I'm traveling, it's, it's crazy how that works. Um, in cool. a, in a team hunger games type scenario where you get, you know, it's two partners, what male CrossFit games athlete would you want on your team? Josh Bridges. Oh, no shit. No doubt about that. What about a female? Yeah, I just- you don't even have to explain, um, Josh. That's a, that's an obvious answer. Female. Who do I feel like? I feel like um, oh, games. Um, I saw off the top of my head. I feel like I feel like uh, I, I mean, if I had to pick individual women, it's probably uh, Katrin David's daughter, just because I feel like she's always got such a good like head on her shoulders. But I would say any of the any of the ladies. Uh, I competed with, you know, Ellie, Lindy, or Kristen, any of the ladies I competed with on Mayhem, because they were just always so level-headed and just cool about stuff, you know, it's like, as everybody always says, like, oh, things look so easy, and you guys are having a good time, but, like, when you're down in the field, you know, you know this, it's like, everything looks like a mess. Right. Um, and they were just always so calm and level-headed. I think I would go with Sam Briggs, because in, in, oh, yeah. in, the, in a Hunger Games situation, you know, we're not going to be, like, deadlifting heavy or anything like that, like clean and jerking. And that's really her, her biggest weakness. I think she could she could climb the hell out killer. of a tree. She could, yeah. She she would not hesitate um, to put a spear through someone. Uh, and she and she's just a, an absolute freak of nature. That's a good choice. I appreciate that. I thought about it before the show, so you know I had a, an unfair advantage. That's all right. I'm just shooting from the hip here. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so I want to I want to get into coaching a little bit. So you've been an L1 coach for a number of years, and you've worked with uh, thousands of aspiring coaches. And I'm I'm kind of just curious with this question. Um, CrossFit has it seems like changed the entire world in making functional fitness cool to the mainstream. And over the years, have you seen like the people that are coming into the L1s? Are they fitter than the people that were coming into the L1s five to eight years ago? This is a really cool question. Like, yeah, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, I think about this a lot because it's, it's an observation that's been really distinct for me. You know, and there are definitely uh, other trainers on staff who have been there much longer than me, You know, Adrian Bosman, uh, Chuck Carswell, just to name a couple there. But even in the – I've been on staff for about six and a half years – and it truly, it's like, I remember six and a half years ago, five years ago, where it's like teaching air squat, teaching front squat to the majority of the group was a real chore. You know, mm-hmm. people only had five double unders. Um, you know, maybe there was one person who could hold the false grip and get a strict muscle up. But now it's like the fitness level is certainly higher. It's, we had a young kid come into a seminar recently, 22 years old. Um, I think his name was Tyler. He's from Massachusetts. He, I was talking to him in the open. I said, how you doing? He said, oh, I, I did the snatch ladder workout, the pull-ups and the snatch. I said, oh, how'd it go? He goes, I finished it. <laughs> I was wow. like, all right, roger that, boss. Um, yeah, so no doubt in my mind, even the first time uh, new coaches and athletes come through a level one environment, much fitter than they were in the past. It's, it's a cool thing to see. It's, you know what's crazy is, is walking into Gold's Gym and, and gyms like that and seeing, a, a, I don't know, I would say a majority of people, maybe I'm, maybe I'm like primed to look for functional movements, but yeah. there's an enormous amount of people these days doing, doing squats, doing deadlifts, doing uh, swings, and a, a lot of them are doing them correctly. You know, and, and five, yeah. ten years ago, it was absolutely atrocious, and and it's not black and white, right? There's still a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of room to grow here, but it, there's been a, a huge, huge impact. Yeah, and just even the knowledge about it, you know, as I travel around, it's you know, you definitely people see your shirt, and you know, a long time ago, sometimes you would be like, oh, what's CrossFit? And now it's, you know, it's at least like Uber drivers would be like, oh yeah, I heard about CrossFit. There's one of those CrossFit gyms near my house, and you know, the spread of it and the education. And yeah, I think just the um, the implications of the growth of CrossFit have have had huge ripples, and it's it is it's amazing and crazy to see because I never thought I don't know if you felt this way, I never thought anyone else was gonna, ever going to find out about CrossFit other than me and my buddies, mm-hmm. you know, who are doing it in board shorts and barefoot, you know, in in a, in, a, in like the local fitness center. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was so. uh, it was seen as just so so extreme. And it, and it yeah. still is by a lot of people. I'm curious, when, it, when an Uber driver, when you get in with an Uber driver and he or she says, oh, I could, you know, a friend of mine does that, he or she is so crazy, I could never do that. It's so extreme. What do you say? Yeah, so I actually just had this the other day. I was, I was taking a ride up to Boston Logan, and the fellow and the, the Uber driver is probably in his 50s. He he um, runner his whole life baseball coach was kind of saying like hey i want you know he was just talking about how bored he was with his training regime and noticed my crossfit shirt and he said you know but i don't a lot of people get hurt you know like isn't that really dangerous and you know i just i use i use what i know as an example and i you know the first example i use especially when people talk about age and fear of crossfit is like hey you know my mom you know was not an athlete throughout her life she's been doing crossfit for four years she's 57 years old and she's really enjoyed it and and I just use examples of I've seen everyone do cross from the ages of 14 to 70. And let me tell you, man, not all of them are, you know, like athletes, you know, in quotes, as people always say, well, that person's an athlete. Or that person has a super metabolism. I'm like, you know, it's not, it's not genetic. And I kind of share that with them. And I try to give them some empowerment of saying like, hey, if you're nervous, voice that to your coach. You know, most good coaches that I've met at affiliates, you know, and you say to them, hey, I want to go a little bit slower, a little bit lighter. I'm scared of this CrossFit thing. I'm not sure what to do. They, they're they really good about taking you under their wing and uh, and responding to that. So that's kind of the message I try and share. I love it. I usually yeah. throw into that uh, the fact that most gyms still offer a free drop-in, like first, first-timer drop-in. Oh, yeah. And a lot of yeah, people yeah. are doing like, you know, very um, – 
extensive like on ramps, which I love, but they still have like a some some type of a one on one drop in one on one at at some point throughout the week. Um, so it's kind of it's very low risk, right? So I think just removing as much of that risk for those potential people um, can be really helpful. Uh, yeah, I get I, I hear the same exact thing almost every time. You know, I'm bored with my workout. Um, I see all of these people, you know, with amazing bodies, but I can never do it. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so and it's not like the, the, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say it's not like we're like some speci- special corner of like the genetic population where it's like we did a single sit up and then all of a sudden you know everybody had abs. You know, I think people sometimes forget that it's like. They, you know, it's like it didn't happen overnight. Right. Kind of on the flip side, within the CrossFit community, um, over the past, I don't know, maybe five years, it seems like there's been this trend within affiliates uh, to train clients like CrossFit Games athletes. And over the past, you know, one to two years, especially. It looks like CrossFit.com is stepping back in and, and making this clear distinction between training for uh, fitness and training for the games. And, and one, one great example was the intro to the new fittest documentary. Did you see that? Oh, sorry. I missed that one part. The, uh, the new uh, fittest on earth documentary. Yeah. Did you see the intro where they said, yeah. where they talked about the difference in training for the games and training, you know, to be fit yeah yeah i did so where do you think that the the community of affiliates is headed in terms of 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 the way that they train their clients are we headed in the right direction or are we still headed in the direction of training you know the average joe uh to go to the crossfit games yeah no i i believe they're headed in the right direction and i think uh one of the reasons I think that, and this is probably still just a small, represent, very small representation still of the affiliate community, is when we have coaches uh, who many are five years plus affiliate members come into the level two environment. We get a lot at the end of the weekend of people saying, hey, you know what, that was really cool, but most of all, it was a really nice reminder of you know how well the basics can work. And I think some of the really successful gyms I see Aside from the coaching service and you know attention to interpersonal services that they that they focus on, is that they're not doing anything like hyper volume or anything crazy complicated. It's just you know it's it's a lot of a simple cocktail of warm up, workout, and cool down. And um, I just and that's most of the gyms I see that are successful. I see those things work very very well. So, and I think it's it's tough too because. I think somewhere along the line, it's like we got confused with thinking like, okay, well, in order to get fit, you have to train like a games athlete. And, you know, and, and that's a little bit misleading. It's like, no, to get fitter, it's like 99.9% of us could continue to do a workout and, you know, follow CrossFit.com and a cool down for the next decade or more and see results of the program. Um, that's the least you need, and even most you need to do if you just want to get fit. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, uh, and I, I do think that we're trending back in the right direction because people are, they're, they're just feeling better, right? With, with good programming, with simple, elegant programming, like, uh, you know, is taught in the L1s these days. I think when I went through it, it wasn't, but when I went through maybe again or, or maybe was interning with the L1 staff, I saw that it had changed. But the way that it's taught now, it's very clear, uh, you know, five to 15 minutes per workout uh, for, for the most part, um, couplets and triplets, very simple movements. When you do that type of programming, people are going to, like you're saying, get fitter and they're going to feel better, right? The, this, this new... Or, or this trend in the direction of training people like CrossFit Games athletes, I think, is leaving a lot of people, uh, you know, feeling a lot tighter and getting injured a lot quicker. Right? They might feel like they can snatch heavier and do more muscle ups, but they're not feeling as good, 
And so I think that's going, you know, people are going to start shying away from that type of training more and more. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the other things that I've started to see is like a lot of um, popular online competitor programming brands have started to add in like some sort of supplemental, like not supplemental, but like another level of like just GPP or, um, you know, like one, you know, like a one hour session or less. And I think this is because people kind of realize, Hey, it was really fun to try and train like a regionals athlete or a games athlete. But damn, because I work a nine to five and I go home and I chase three kids around, I don't have the time for this anymore. I just really want to be fit. Right. And so I I think you'll see a, I think you'll see a shift back to it because it is like the basic application does work and it, it works really well. And, um, it's funny. I was talking to Pat Sherwood about this a long time ago and, and he was kind of saying like, you know, I used to be really, really righteous about this, you know, just warm up, have a workout, you know, drink cold brew with your buddies and just have some damn fun and quit taking yourself so seriously. But he also said, he said, you know what, if you're doing more workouts just because you love being in the gym and you have the time and the money to do it and you're staying safe, he's like, who am I to tell you not to work out? You know, and I think there's there's still some element to that, but I don't think that's going to be the majority uh, of athletes that that populate affiliates. Right. What do you think are the three most important characteristics or skills of a good coach, and how can people practice these? Um, I think the first thing uh, a coach needs to have is a very solid understanding of who they are and I think how do they practice that and maybe what do I mean I think they I hear let me rephrase that I think a coach has to have a very high level of self-awareness they need to know what makes themselves tick they need to be very open and capable of understanding you know what positive and negative feelings and emotions they have and capable of diffusing those emotions to the extent of if they're angry, if they're frustrated, um, to not focus on being angry or frustrated or what instead focusing on what other elements, you know, around them that they can change and actually influence to help alleviate, uh, that friction or stress. I think, yeah, self-awareness is probably the first really really big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the wording's not perfect, but I think, you know, self-awareness, um, I think they have to have an enormous amount, and this I think comes with self-awareness, um, when you really become aware of your own self and your own vulnerabilities and what makes you happy and you scared, you develop a really big level of compassion for other people. And I think that's another huge one is just realizing that there's somebody else out there in the same or worse boat as you and that, wow, you know, the entire world is not about you. It's like you could probably still, you know, you might be capable of lending them a hand and that your time and attention might be important to them. I think, you know, that's really important is uh, the compassion piece. Um, And I would say the third piece I think that's really important in a coach is to be a, um, not infinite, but uh, um, a constant learner. That's not the exact phrase I want, but for them to understand that, you know, they do have some good knowledge that they can share and they have experiences that are unique to them, but that there is always a little bit more to learn. You know, I guess that would be like a, you know, knowledge with humility. Those are great, great answers. I, I like that the, the fir- you know, none of those have anything to do with, you know, how much you know apparently <laughs> or spotting movement or, um, you know, being loud or being a motivator. But, I, you know, the first couple especially, if you have self-awareness and compassion, you're going to you're gonna you're gonna want to figure things out for your for those people, right? If you have especially compassion, you're you're not you're not gonna sit on your hands and just watch people move because you really care about them. So you're gonna go out, you're gonna learn as much as you can, and when someone comes that comes in with a problem that you don't know the answer to, you're going to go and figure it out because you know you have that base level of compassion. Rather than, you know, on the flip side, having an enormous amount, you know, you have degrees, you have uh, all kinds of certifications, you've read all of the T Nation articles, but you don't really care about people. Yeah. Um, You know, you're not going to even be able to use that information as well as someone who really, really cares about people and, and doesn't even know half of what you know. 
So I really love those answers. Thanks. Yeah, that was hard off the cuff, but I think if I had to like put words to the feelings that I have, you know, when I look at somebody like I really like being coached by that person, or I'd like to emulate them as a coach or a leader, I think that's kind of what what uh, what comes up in my head. Yeah, you crushed it. What do you think are the biggest mistakes you see coaches making in terms of a coaching movement? Biggest mistake in terms of coaching movement. Um, you know, I, I'll say this. The beautiful thing about functional movements and the human body in general, which amazes me, is like it was made to be ridden hard and put away wet. Like we have, you know, in some ways an incredible durability. And I think because of that, I think um, coaches can just get used to it. And I think as an old coach Glassman quote, he said, don't let your eyes get used to their shitty movement. I think it's like we can see people move, you know, okay and still make progress and not get injured. And because of that, it's like you just become complacent because it's like, oh, the system works and it works okay at 60%. Right. And um, I, and I, it's, it's not to say like coaches are, are careless or negligent. I just think it's sort of it becomes like, well, it seems to be working all right. So, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of attitude. I think that's, a, that's kind of a – when coaching movement, I think that's one trap they can fall into. Yeah, people – a lot of people, especially guys in my experience, can be very resistant to to coaches <laughs> giving them very simple suggestions, right? And, and maybe they try it and they really struggle with it, but you know they just can't they they can't seem to keep their their chest up or their knees out or whatever it is, and so they're very resistant. And I I see a lot of coaches like you're saying becoming complacent, and I've experienced it myself. It's very tempting to not give up on the person, but just say, you know, I tried everything I can. He or she doesn't want to keep, you know, trying to keep mm. his chest up. And so mm. I'm just going to accept that fault. Right. Yeah. But if you keep, if you keep at them and you try different things, maybe it's not that they don't want to, maybe it's some kind of restriction, mobility restriction or movement pattern issue. Um, I think that that's the, the, the absolute best way to go about coaching. And that's and I try, the analogy I try to use with coaches when because they talk to me about this a lot. Like, oh, you know, one of the biggest things they say is like, hey, look, what if you have somebody who's really resistant to change, or what if they have a tough fix? You know, like, how do you handle that? And the analogy I try to use is like, look, if you, you know, could only do ten pull-ups was your max pull-ups, and every single workout you ever did, you either did ten pull-ups or less, and that's all you ever tried to do. Like, you're never going to get eleven pull-ups. Like, sometimes you got to run before you walk. You're not going to learn that lesson until you try and get that 11th pull up and you're not going to learn to see if you're capable of fixing something that's difficult to fix until you get out there and try even if you fail you know it's like there's a huge learning process there and it's scary man it's like especially as a coach and you have some athletes who give you some pushback and there's a lot going on in the workout like it can definitely be an intimidating process we may have already covered this but what do you think is the biggest mistake people are making in their programming for the general population Actually, you know, I, I would say, I, I think in the past it would have been like they're putting in too much volume. What I will say is that they're not making a plan for how to apply it to everyone in their class. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, um, you know, it's definitely, I think there's a point where there's too much you program for a class. But uh, even if you did program a little bit too much volume or things to do in a class, if you sat down and you thought about – made a class plan and you thought about things like how long do I want this to take? What do I want them to get out of each movement? What do I have to teach them to keep them safe and make them better? Um, how am I going to scale my athletes? How long should each workout take? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do for a warm-up and a cool-down? I think if people plan that kind of stuff out more, it's like – you would be surprised at how much you could get ac accomplished. Now, I'm not saying you know go out there, program a lot of volume, make a class plan, it'll be okay. Right. But spending that time to plan can really help you take care of a lot of the unknowns that might pop up in a class, and focus more on the actual act of coaching. You know, improving human movement and having some fun and building community. Right. So you know maybe one one or two of your athletes that show up in class, it, that that high volume work might be the perfect stimulus for them, but if you have a plan on how to adapt that workout for the rest of your members, then it's not it's not dangerous and, it, and it's not a bad thing, right? It can actually you can you can make that work. Is that kind of what you're getting at? 
Yeah, it probably could be done. But, you know, the caveat is like there certainly is going to be too much volume for a class environment just by the nature of the fact that it's fit to an hour. And right. and not, you know, it's like maybe one person out of your 500 member affiliate is a regionals athlete. But, uh, yeah, I think making a plan of how to apply a piece of programming and teach a class can be really, really helpful, immensely helpful. What is something that you've changed your mind on in the last six to 12 months in – exercise science um, the thing that I've changed my mind on you know I would say personally it, how nutrition affects us um, when we're not training and how important nutrition is when I kind of step back from competing and I took a really large amount of time off from the gym did at you first get a free I was dad, dad bod? no I did not get a free dad dad bod but I noticed like I was eating pretty crappy you know doing like the refined foods right, high carb right. you know just I was doing the old you know see it need it diet and I even though so I started eating better and I started trying to like maybe weigh and measure a little bit and just take a closer look at my intake and, and have meals throughout the day instead of just snacking and even though I was working out a lot less, I felt really good. And um, it made my transition back into training really easy. And, uh, you know, like I kept a – I don't want to say figure because that doesn't sound very manly. <laughs> but like I, I kept like – I felt what I felt was like, a, you know, like a decent, you know, body type even though I wasn't training a lot. And it was just – I think a lot of it – I have to say a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was just eating a little bit better and paying attention to it. Right. And I never, you know, it's like I always knew how important it was and you know, I fly that flag and I believe it, but I think personally I was like you know, if you try hard enough and you're young enough, you cannot train a bad diet. But that was just a really naive outlook. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, it's funny cuz I can I can relate so much to your entire experience going through all of this, but for me, I grew up in the south and I I yeah. Definitely worked my way into a pre dad dad bod, no doubt about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's uh, what? What is your definition of a successful CrossFit gym? And and if one, if a specific one comes to mind, share that. Um, definition of a su successful CrossFit gym. I mean, personally, I've never run a gym, so I. I you know, I don't think I've I've looked at this um, with an immense amount of thought, but I think when I go visit gyms and some of the things I kind of peek at and, and really like to see, um, I think one of the things that always kind of you know t turns my eye. The first thing is just a really welcoming and friendly membership and coaching staff. You know, it's like when you walk in and people make eye contact and introduce themselves and 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 you know use your name. I don't know what the specific term for that is. Maybe, maybe that's your evaluation of a community, but I think that's a really, really important thing. And then um, I think from the basic piece is one where it seems like the athletes are happy with their results, whether those results are something very objective like – my PRs have increased and my body fat percentage has gone down, et cetera, to just people saying I look, feel, and you know, feel like I perform better. I think those for me are two big things that really turn my – you know, that I really like to see. And if I was in that area, I'd want to go to that affiliate. Yeah, it's the best feeling in the world, uh, you know, especially traveling and going to a new and, and, you know, maybe a little uncomfortable place and walking in and people treating you like family, right? Like they're, they're actually your friends already. Um, and there's, there's a lot of gyms that, that don't treat you that way. And it's a, you know, it's just like you're getting a quick workout in, which is not a big deal, but it's such a, a, a funner and more fulfilling experience. Um, having that kind of welcoming for sure. And I would say there's another aspect to this. And, and I think because to a lot of people and a lot of affiliates, success could be um, relative to their what their outlying goals were. But I, I do think eventually um, 
whatever this means, you know, whether it's financial or something like that, I think it's really important for an affiliate to have its own stuff in order so it can better serve everybody else around them. You know, it's like, I don't, you know, they don't have to have the most members in the world or, you know, pulling in the biggest bankroll at the end of the month. But I think it's really important for an affiliate to have their back end things in order enough where they're like, you know, they're not so concerned with that stuff so they can be concerned about, you know, how are they taking care of their membership? If that makes sense. And like, oh, you know, absolutely. I don't have, a, I don't have a ton of education on that world. And like I said, it's like, I don't think you need to be, you know, Warren Buffett <laughs> to run a successful gym, but you know, it's like, you can't pour from an empty cup and you gotta, you gotta have some of that business stuff squared away. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, that all affects the customer experience, right? Because yeah. if you're too busy, you know, trying to keep up with, um, I don't know, you know, tracking your, your taxes and, and doing, um, all your scheduling and checking emails and all of that, right? If you don't have good systems in place to allow you the time to spend time with your, with your clients, with your members, then, you know, that's going to be a poor customer experience. Yeah. And I think that's why self-awareness is so important. Cause it's like, Hey, you might not know anything about business, but I bet you know enough to step back and be like, you know, it's like, I can't buy another barbell because the rent's too high. Well, maybe, you know, and it's like, I've been tracking all my members by, you know, just on cash transactions. And maybe I just need to step back and look at that. I think if you have really strong self-awareness and you can be vulnerable with yourself, it's like, maybe you have to reach outside to have somebody else give you a little tip. But um, I think a lot of the times you can figure that stuff out. What are the best resources you found personally for deepening your knowledge of coaching and strength and conditioning in general? Um, first and foremost, the best resources are everyone around me, whether it's um, a sports specific coach, a new coach at a level one, and just listening to their story and how they've used you know, their knowledge or experience of fitness or strength conditioning to improve people's lives. I mean, it's just literally the, the other human beings around me, they have something that I will not be able to have and that's their own experience. And man, is that, it's valuable. Like I, that can't be said enough. Um, the next one, having a plan for continued education, I think would be the, be the next one. I, I know it seems kind of silly, but, um, you know, in a, when I went through the CrossFit um, coaches sort of, or the CrossFit level three, you know, they have continuing education credits. And I think that's a really good thing because you can make small goals for yourself. And it, it does put you, you know, it's like you might have this mindset where it's like, oh, I always want to be a learner. But, um, you know, the thought, the thought is cheap. You know, you need to have a plan for how to go out there and do that. And so I think sim similarly having a, a secondary reason to push yourself to learn more has been really, 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 really influential on me. And I think this last one ties back into a common theme, which I brought up a couple of times. Maybe I sound like a broken record. I hope not. But that was um, looking at stories of leadership and um, stories of learning outside of the fitness industry. And just because you do see like with great leaders and very successful people, whether they are manufacturing um, cyclone tubes to make vacuums or playing soccer or coaching a CrossFit class. There's a lot of common threads there between all of those successful people or effective leaders. And I think that has been something very helpful to me to give me a lot of new perspectives. Is there anything that jumps out as, at you, like books that you've read or any, any other resources um, along those lines? Um, yeah, I just, I mean, I read a book recently called, uh, or a while ago called black box thinking. I can't remember the author's yeah, last right. name. I think it was Saeed maybe. Um, but it was just a really interesting book and what he just analyzes and he, man, talk about a, talk about, uh, a huge discussion and really hitting the same topic and over and over again. But, uh, he really just discussed about how successful people learn from failure and how sometimes unsuccessful people, instead of learning from failure, look at failure as, um, a reason to stop and an obstacle, whereas, you know, the other, you know, successful people and effective leaders look at failure as an opportunity to learn. Right. Um, and I thought that was, that book was really, really helpful. Uh, recently I, I've also been reading, um, uh, what was it? Oh, 
I can't think of it off the top of my head. The title. Well, we, we will. Sorry, uh, this escaped no, no, me right now. No worries, dude. Uh, we will post that in the show notes. That's Matthew Said, I think. Okay, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, just that's a, really... a huge kind of point in the whole growth mindset topic is that, that piece of failure, right? Uh, growth minded people see failure as just a part of the learning process, right? Whereas fixed minded people see it as yeah, crushing and a reason to quit. Yeah, and it just and the book like it, it definitely highlights the, those lessons almost to the point of it being ad nauseum. But um, it came across in a in a really really powerful way, and I, I like that. And it kind of helped me look at things a little bit differently. And it has some nice sort of like practical ways to approach it. I read this book recently um, by by a Buddhist. Um, I don't think I pronounced his name correctly. I think it was Thich Nhat Han. Uh, it's called Pieces Every Step, and I really like that because he kind of gives you he's very practical in the sense that he talks about and you were saying you do you know you do your 20 minutes of meditation in the morning he gives you these a lot of just easy steps of how to practice mindfulness Mm -hmm. and in all kinds of different moments and scenarios that we deal with in modern life and i thought it was really useful just from the standpoint of like how do you deal with stress of being busy you know like how do you keep a clear head how do you not just always react to situations and i thought it's been very nice for that and that's those are skills you need as a coach that you know have nothing to do with knees out heels down chest up right that's stuff that's gonna impact your entire life actually i love that yeah well cool man that's all i got dude anything else you want to leave these listeners with uh i just i really appreciate uh i really appreciate your time mike and uh i just i hope i encourage people to you know like i said it's like it's a good lesson to learn that it's not all about you but that doesn't mean that your contribution uh doesn't matter and um you know, there's there's no need to ever to ever stop learning, and there's no um, you don't need a reason to help out. So Ooh, man, I really appreciate I like being here. That's and, a fucking that's a that's a quote you can put up on a wall right there. That's the best I got right I now. I like it, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate your time. Um, this has been phenomenal. Yeah, Mike. Good luck to you, and uh, congrats again, man. Thanks, brother. Have a great day. <laughs>